And that statement is true even if the reduction spines doesn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> systems, methods, and methodologies there, the various, the various uh, some of them are quite uh, similar, others they diverge a lot. But what they have in common is the notion of feedback. And I'd like to show you that I'm taking this very seriously. 1469 is the number of days from my previous talk here. As I said, you know, this is um, four years, which, by the way, I think is a uh, decent frequency. <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's, not, that's not my point, that's just a wink to Patrick and Steve. <laughs> uh, then I talked about records and efficiency, and after the talk, uh, uh, I got all the questions about the presentation software I was using. So, to avoid that, I decided today to use uh, just PowerPoint. Uh, the other feedback was that I didn't present myself, so I'll spend one minute about that. So, what would count as relevant experience? It started 23 years ago. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I started uh, as uh, building software companies and playing different roles there, mostly as CIO, but also as a member of board and on the trenches as project manager. So I got different uh, angles, which gave me a legitimacy to, to continue as a, a freelancer, as an independent consultant, um, mainly first with enterprise architecture and business process management, then management consulting where a lot of uh, things and stuff happened, and also with uh, linked enterprise data, which basically means using semantic technologies and linked data principles inside enterprises. In my free time, I enjoy sailing, music, and tennis. And speaking of music, I'm playing a rock band, but at home, I listen to, to jazz, and today I'm talking, I'm talking about pop which is the way my talk is abbreviated. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I've chosen that acronym because this is, uh, for me, ultra-systemic topic and highly unpopular. But also it's a very difficult topic. So I was surprised I was put first. I should have uh, come last. One for the survivors, but yeah, so here we go. I'll try to make it easy, and the structure is very simple. I'll deconstruct the title to make the structure backwards. So, first about paradoxes, uh, just a reminder what they are, uh, why they are avoided, why they are avoided, and why they shouldn't be when we are discussing social systems like organizations. Then about organizational paradoxes, why all decisions are by nature paradoxical, how organizations reproduce themselves through decisions, and how decisions absorb uncertainty. And last, productive, is uh, why I'm using productive, you will see that, and um, <laughs> uh, it will be also how to use this knowledge in practice. This is the practitioner government. So the point one and two are theoretical, and uh, I, I apologize about that. I'll try to keep them just not more than half. But the paradox is that if I don't spend enough time, then the third will not be understood. So you have to bear with me. Paradoxes, just a reminder what is a paradox, uh, but even before that, it seems like there is a growing interest in uh, paradoxes in organizations. And I would like to make a distinction between what you would find in literature, like this um, uh, Oxford uh, book of organizational paradoxes. They're understood as tensions and contradictions. But here in the, what I'm using as a basis of this term, the social system theory paradoxes uh, are something that uh, is only of the self referential nature. So not about tensions, it's something which is using self-reference 
And that's how social systems are produced according to that theory. So what is the paradox? <laughs> example of a classical example is the statement is false. So which if it is what it says, then it's true, but it's true, then it's false because it's self-reference. If you are you know, inclined to mathematics, then this is a simple equation. When you go like this, you'll find that there is no solution in real numbers. That's why people came up with what they call imaginary numbers. Uh, the definition of self-reference, uh, the best one I found is uh, with Kaufman, not to be confused with Stuart Kaufman. Uh, Self-reference is the infinite, infinite class. Mandelbrot used self-referential equation in a very interesting way. Uh, he just solved the spatial paradox in time and then represented it back in space, which produced integral forms. And that approach is quite often now used. In fact, if you take any software program, it will contain uh, loops. And the equation will be n equal to n plus 1, which is a paradox, but actually time is not. In the East, that uh, was never a problem. Uh, I think two many ago, there was this system Tatus Koti, which means four corners, and they stand for not only being and not being, the corresponding of true and false, but also both and neither. An example of neither would be a statement like tomorrow will rain, which is neither true nor false because nobody knows where tomorrow. In the West, that's not the case. In the West, we have Aristotle and the laws of thought. And the laws of thought is what governs what governs uh, a lot of uh, technologies, and in fact, the whole science is based on that, on the no contradiction. They're quite useful, but um, the habit of using them in uh, sciences like physics, mathematics, is transferred into social systems, and that's problematic. Why is it problematic? Because in other sciences, the, the, uh, the person studying the science does not influence what they discover. Newton discovered law of gravity, but that did not change gravity. That's not the case with social systems. And good examples are Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Actually, what they did changed their object of study. So, yes, we need the laws of thought, but they are from the perspective of first order observation. And in the end, second and higher order observations, we need just the opposite, what uh, Ansel Forster calls laws of cybernetics, the laws of paradox, ambivalence, and control. In using that, uh, there are quite good theories that um, are applied in social systems to understand organization. I'm, I'm going to use a few of those. From mathematics, George Pester Brown laws of form, and from biology, auto basis. These are the building blocks of uh, Nicholas Luhmann social system theory. So, uh, normally I would skip the part with laws of form, but I just found out that um, <coughs> you need a bit of a reference if you have not read that book. And, and uh, some people that study Nicholas Luhmann but they do not actually pay attention to that and they make wrong, uh, wrong conclusions. So, what I am going to say, I'll just scratch the surface. Don't take it uh, as, a, as a crash course on uh, the calculus publications, just, uh, just some references that you have. It starts with the idea of uh, distinction, which is the, the most elementary cognitive operation. Like if you go to the smallest particle in other studies like the matter for cognition, that, that would be the, the minimum thing in the sense that uh, there can be anything less than that unless you recognize something from what is not, unless you distinguish it. 
So with this sign, uh, George Benson Brown also does the annotation to distinguish what is inside and what is outside. And it's a powerful sign because, in fact, it makes a lot of things at once. It uh, indicates the inside, the outside. Uh, it is itself a sign, as a distinction, and also um, it is, shows the operation of making a distinction, but it should be made by somebody, so it also indicates the observer. And the laws of form themselves are the laws of calling. The distinction that makes again, made, made again, is condensed to the same distinction, it, which is basically a way of defining what information is, in the sense that if somebody <coughs> tells me, you know, it's raining, and then five minutes later, tells me again, now it's raining. First time it's information, second time it's not. I already know, I'm already informed. That's why the two distinctions will condense into one, unless I've forgotten in the meantime. <clears throat> and then. Well, I want to say a question about assuming, of course, that the context is not changing. Because if you're changing the, the context, the distinction will be something different. Recognizing the change of the context will be at least 20 more distinctions that you have to make. make. So, uh, this is a very elementary uh, operation that we are talking about. I, I don't want to introduce a too difficult uh, proposition, but actually, Kabbalism introduced a more fundamental principle. So, it's Brown took the second step from Kabbalism as his fundamental step, not the first step. Let's put it this way, if we compare laws of form with volume algebra, then... Which are already based on intellect, which is only one line of thinking. Then, it's, then he starts just earlier with less assumptions, which enable him to continue further, right. embracing also the paradox. So I don't want to disrupt the... And the last one is the re-entry, which is in fact uh, <coughs> Perenberg's list naturally in that system, the calculus of education. And then later on, uh, Francisco Varela introduced a separate calculus based on that autonomous state, which is uh, the, the re-entry. And then we have uh, all two places, which is uh, the theory of uh, Joanna and Varela, which basically <laughs> says uh, three things, and uh, the classical example is uh, the, uh, the cell. Uh, that um, we need to have um, or, or two basis is self production. We need to have um, a semi permeable boundary as the first condition, and the second condition is a network of reactions that produce the elements of that network. And the third condition is that these reactions should also produce the boundary, which should be able to enable these reactions. So if the boundary is not there, the chemicals will disperse, they will not react. <coughs> but the boundary is only there because they react and they produce it. At the same time, of course, it's semi-permeable, that's why it has uh, interaction, it can get energy, and uh, take out exhaust from this. Uh, and that idea is uh, used to describe social system by, by Nicholas Lohmann, which we are going to, to now. So, uh, the, the ideas of uh, Spencer Brown's fact in, in every page of, of uh, social theory, which is described in over 70 books, by the way, uh, they are based on the idea of distinction but also on a hot basis. With that difference, here we're not talking about the physical elements that produce each other, but communications. And the communications are understood as a synthesis of understanding, announcement, and information. I understand I'm throwing these things to you just to get the references. I'm not going deep into them, but I need them a, a bit. And for organizations, so social systems are the system of science, the system of education, 
communication system of all organizations a specific type of social systems where the type of communication that works are decisions. So we have three important uh, blocks here to understand, radical blocks. One is that decisions reduce organizations connecting to each other and referring to each other. The second one is because social systems are made up only of communications, people are not part of the social systems. And the third is the idea of structural coupling. Organizations are structurally coupled with other organizations, <coughs> which means other social systems, but also with biological systems like people. Structural coupling means that they evolve together, they influence each other, but the influences are triggered by their internal structure, not by how they irritate each other. If I, if I kick a dog, the reaction of the dog will not depend on my kick, but on the internal structure of the dog, on the state of the dog, and then it can things like that. So I will use that notation to simplify this, uh, and this is how it would look, interaction between uh, organizations in this case and, and the people around them. So now back to the idea of distinction. The first thing to understand is the idea of uh, events as something produced by people because they can distinguish before and after. A type of events, a communication, which is the unity of distinction between utterance, information, and understanding. And now you can see that there's a Venn diagram. A type of event and a type of communication is decision, which can distinguish the be selected and not selected after distinguishing before and after, because when decision is made, the, the world is different than before the decision is made, for those that can recognize that. And of course, it is only interesting in social systems if it is communicated, not if it exists as a thought. And decisions where uh, everything is actually now coming to the, the topic of uh, why, we, why we spend time on, on paradoxes. Decisions are paradoxes. Not some decisions. All decisions are paradoxes. And I'm trying to convince you with five reasons they're paradoxes. First is coming from Hans von Horstmann. Only those questions which are in principle undecidable, we can decide. Which means that whatever is decidable is something that can be calculated. There is no need to make a decision. If there is a need to make a decision, then that's because something is undecidable. Second reason is that what a decision is, what is regarded as a decision, it's just another decision, something that not be understood in the social system as a decision. This is a difficult one, but I'll give it a try anyway. So the time is something produced by our ability to distinguish before and after. But the decision also makes another re-entry into that distinction, making in a point of time a difference between before decision is made and after it. And this one and the next one are the most important for what will follow. Every decision has to communicate its alternative, otherwise not a decision. If it was something which didn't have an alternative, then it was a calculation of decision. So it communicates its alternative, but also it communicates that it is not its alternative, otherwise nothing will decide. The communication of the alternative is a very important feature of decisions. Why? Because it allows to regret, criticize, and blame. And, and that's an important for organizations. And the fifth reason is uh, to understand 
not for decisions themselves, but the network of decisions as, as a paradoxical network, as a self referential network. So imagine in a moment, T1, there are several alternatives, and the decision maker makes a choice. Now, making a choice would enable other decisions to be made. But these decisions are actually the thing which will create the decision backwards. Because if nothing connects to the previous decision as its premise, it will just go as a conventional noise, it will disappear. So only if what is enabled refers to what enables it. Only in that case, the previous potential decision is now communicated the decision, and this goes uh, forth and back. You see, it wasn't much. Now, uh, projective, the, 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 the word, was it very hard? Projective. Uh, why I use projective? The first is already clear. Organizations are produced by paradoxes if you believe what I said so far. Uh, the second I'll explain now. There is a productive misunderstanding between organizations. And to explain that, I'll first talk about, so remember the notion of sexual government. So imagine science and organizations that want to use something of that science. Science is a social system which is produced by its communications. Its communications are quite popular ones are scientific papers. Scientific papers are self-referential. That's the way they would function. They are criteria for what is scientific and unscientific. And, and the, the papers, they try to work over the code true and false, referring to other communications, other scientific papers. So you wouldn't find anything which is not self-referential. How would you recognize something non-self-referential? Or if you read a scientific paper, and among the uh, citations, there is something which is not a scientific paper, but for example, uh, newspaper article then it would be, but, but that's not, not the case. So that's how they, and th that's good, that's how the science is. People think, well, suffer from something bad, but this, this, there's no way, other way to function. So when communication goes out and enters the so-called practice, it is decoded so that it can link with internal communications of organizations of those practices. It can be only there, which would inevitably mean that it is in all cases misunderstood. But that misunderstanding can be productive and quite often is. And the third uh, reason I use productive is just to break this spell of uh, things coming from second order semantics and social theory that they're not going to want in practice because uh, I'm doing yeah. that. These are, for example, age applications, uh, for which I'll tell you a few words. Uh, the first will be managing constraints, something I've been practicing uh, for years in certain kind of workshops. The other is a practice of uh, discovering decision patterns. The third one is certain hidden dependency which people, when they follow the uh, typology, they could miss. The fourth is a bit of a different way to understand power in organizations. Uh, the fifth is about decision packages or, or policies or certain documents that are collection of decisions. The next one is about uh, business to business interactions, and it is actually uh, related to this misunderstanding. Then uh, another 
uh, which I'm applying in enterprise architecture, which I call the SASI architecture. That stands for semantic architecture of social systems. And the last one is uh, sort of an answer of a possible question: how how to combine this with the DSM? I call that the SSM variable social system mindset. Can you repeat the SASI again? SASI stands for Semantic Architecture for Social Systems. <coughs> yeah, there we go. Managing constraints. So um, this was the um, way I started to solve the problem in business process optimization workshops. Uh, I started this in like 2002, 2003. <coughs> there is this usual practice. You describe the situation or the business processes and you describe to the situation. And then people either tend to fix what they don't like in disease is describing their to be, or uh, they just use a lot of constraints when they describe it to be. And what I found out is that the certain techniques to deconstruct what I call constraint molecules into uh, two components which are quite often coupled. One is something I would call natural limitation. For example, can we be at the same time speaking here and in Brussels? And the other is decision-based limitation. People tend to put constraints where they would like to describe what they want to achieve, their, their ideal process. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying ideal process also to hint that this practice is a bit similar to the Aikoff's ideal design, if you, if you know this, this kind of method. So the deconstructing them uh, helps to, to release certain energy for innovation and it's, it's working quite well. The next one is related to um, the habit of keeping vision logs. Why that could be useful? Decision logs. Why that could be useful? So, uh, imagine your world would look something like that. So, um, there are alternatives that are considered and others that are not, but also feasible. And those that are considered are constrained by certain things which could not be considered. So there are certain options that are excluded. Now, if we follow that, at some point we choose one of those, and then next one again, and next one again, then Remember, those that connect to each other, they actually produce decision backwards. So the rest <coughs> would be organizational noise. It will just disappear. In many cases, maybe you've experienced that. You go to a meeting, you decide certain things. Next meeting, some of those things are just not connected at all and may disappear. But there is something more interesting that happens. At a later point, when certain decisions uh, are forgotten, it turns out that some of the constraints that limit our choice in the future are because of decisions that we make within this technology. And doing that often can create the habit of recognizing what type of decisions can bring that. Now, these constraints are of two times as well. So I'll just make a, a small theoretical uh, qualification. Now. These are, when we get the constraints, some of them will be decisions, some of them will be not. But that, that kind of practice, apart from what I said so far, 
about creating the habits of recognizing what type of decisions will bring certain constraints and will limit our options in the future. It's also a way to understand planning. So planning, in fact, is a way of designing fusion premises. You fix something which you use for a certain period to base your fusion on. We decided to meet the deadline to do this and not that. So you would package your fusion premises. And, and I will continue with that practice in the following minutes. To see certain things that we are well in, uh, in, a, in a different way. Now, just, just think about planning for, for a bit more. A perfect planning would imply perfect knowledge of the future, which would imply deterministic universe, which would make planning a mystery. And the other is uh, a different understanding of, of power. And I remember uh, Tom Graves said that unlike in, in physics, where power is defined as the ability to do work, in social systems is the ability to avoid work. I, I would use also some reference to, to physical things because I found that that's pretty good way to demonstrate uh, decision-based understanding of power. So you should get that diagram and imagine there is a very heavy object placed like that. <clears throat> and then a, a person with power, I mean, the, 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 the harder force, the, the, the more this uh, could be moved, could be, could be slightly to the left. So the power holder will, will try to push it. And, and you, you are the power subject. You have these five choices. The stronger that push, then you would have less of those decisions you nominated. And you have to consider others that are feasible, but, but more excluded. And you can build on that uh, a lot. So, uh, one useful habit uh, was, apart from power, to see other things. So, so currently, when I hear things like, my task is, I have a mandate for, our objective is, it gets immediately translated in my mind as it was decided that with a whole package of paradoxes and technology and everything like that, and so far. And that helps to understand other things, uh, but, but now I'm going to the next um, application, which is discovering, discovering hidden patterns. So if we plot time, uh, certain decisions, uh, like uh, uh, a project starts, which let's call it to implement business analysis dashboard. Now, this is um, it appears as a, as, as, a, as a fictional case, but in fact, it is a generalization of over 100 actual cases that happened. So, um, start so-called bad project. So, why starting this bad project? Well, because at a higher level of power and previous in time, that investment approved by the high IT board, by AD, uh, I mean business analysis dashboard. Why it was uh, approved? Well, because now I'm using the why, but that's not the, the right way to do it because it was a selection of that premise to be selected otherwise. So approved. Uh, the bad business case was approved somewhere lower. In that case, it was something called um, an investment team. And why it was approved? Because uh, there were few alternatives, but BAD was selected using a SWOT analysis. 
And how it was calculated so far? Well, it connected to other previous decisions. One is the principle preferred by to build. The other is trust God on reports. And the other is use SWOT in business cases. And that was decided by a person called X. But to hire that person or to give the power of that person to uh, make the decision, uh, it was decided by another person uh, and so forth. That would be a pretty easy thing to do. But in fact, if you would like to prevent certain bad things to happen, this technology would not help a lot. Because all those things that are used as decision premises, they somehow were made attractive. And they were made attractive by decisions that led to them made previously. So, if you find out that different decisions connected to prefer buying to build, use SWOT, trust government report earlier, that already increased uh, the, the likelihood of them being selected now. So, that would create a habit to recognize when certain things might become very popular vision premises and maybe early on make this destabilize them so that such bad things don't happen. Or in other words, this kind of connection is not the important one. <coughs> the important one is the connection between the decision now and those colored dots that are not part of its chain. Then I found something more interesting, which comes from uh, what I call decision packages. And again, this is this is a real example. Decision packages, I would call them an important document, a policy document, or something like that. It contains decisions, uh, one way or another. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not talking about some document that just goes around. I'm, I'm talking about documents that decide big change of structures in Spain of hundreds of billions of euros. And here is what I uh, discovered that happens quite often. Uh, and one of these cases was quite painful to me. There is a policy A, vision package A, which is great. In that case, it was. It was Spectacular. And then later on, uh, certain people with less power, they decided another package, B, another policy B, which was based on and elaborated the policy A. But in fact, as a policy B, it only selected certain decisions that were aligned with the agenda and all the rest were not. Yet, officially, that was a, a, an elaboration and a, um, implementation of that policy A. And because uh, this communication was communicated that A is supported by B, this made B a very attractive decision premise and many connected to it. Why? Because it's more recent, because it's more concrete. Because people promoted it uh, much more than A, and because it already <coughs> claimed that it was an implementation of A. But in fact, what he produced the result was <coughs> the opposite of the A intention. Uh, yeah. The next thing, thing is um, this uh, business uh, to business interactions. Uh, the idea that when something goes outside one uh, operationally closed system to another with which it is structurally coupled, it, it is decoded uh, and encoded again so that it is taken up by the internal communication network. And I will show you how, how, I, uh, 
and we discovered that is a very good explanatory part of certain phenomena. First, when I observed uh, in, in big organizations, I'm talking about uh, organizations with uh, uh, over 20,000 uh, people, uh, is the phenomena of local optimum. So there is one important project, and the project metrics are great. The KPIs show that it's a very successful project. But in fact, it creates a local optimum because it is detrimental for the overall uh, enterprise. The second is uh, a duality. Project KPIs uh, show that the project is doing good, and then clients are not happy, or the opposite. Uh, and the third is about something very interesting: how the Evaluation evolves. So, but we again in the in the, in the project uh, example. At some point, at the end of the project, the project is said to be successful. And a year later, the same group of stakeholders said, "Well, that project was indeed successful." But quite often, I don't know if you participate in that. They say that project was a failure. A year. Or just the opposite. They said the project is a failure at the end, and a year later that it was a success. success. Very interesting thing. The path B, uh, what, what I experienced was due to uh, maturity in terms of uh, managing difficult projects in that organization. They had no idea that this project had no chance to succeed uh, so much. And later on, when they gained maturity, compared to the new project that failed, they saw that early one as quite successful, relatively. So you're attributing the change uh, to a change in organization? Yeah. Uh, um, because then you're feeling that maturity. Yeah. That was my initial thought. Now I'll, I'll continue. Then, uh, what uh, I started to apply is something I called a uh, for you test. I found out that to chart it, uh, it, every project should meet three criteria. One is, is it successful? Is it, sorry, is it useful? Whatever it produced, does it work? And the third is it used. So if it's useful and used but doesn't work, it's a failure. If it's used and work but it's not useful, again, it's a failure. So you also can see that they have a different difference plan. And that worked for some projects to explain how these things happen with the change of uh, understanding. They should be successful, but the seed was not. Uh, and then, in fact, what uh, helped to solve the rest of the cases was that uh, idea of productive misunderstanding. In fact, the requirements of communication, <coughs> they appear as understood, but they can only be taken up by the project organization if it's part of its own self-referential network. And luckily, it wasn't only me that found out that there are two, two cases from Australia I've compared uh, two projects in construction with the same project manager, the same methodology. Uh, one of them was uh, under budget uh, and it was in a shorter time, but the plan was unsuccessful, and the other uh, just the opposite. It's very interesting cases. I have put here a reference you can follow that. The other is uh, what I call the SASI architecture. Uh, semantic architecture of social systems. Uh, this is a bit technical, so not go into that. But it is a way of combining the two paradigms: <coughs> paradigm of the first order and the end of all the observation. By, uh, from one side, having a different approach to information management, decoupling data from applications, fully centralized and yet with explicit semantics to make uh, less contradiction in fact to make all what that paradigm is all about and at the same time understand 
social system is paradoxes can combine that to uh, a big understanding. If some reaches there, there will be a reference, you can, you can follow it and read more. Uh, and then, of course, the question comes, uh, well, how to combine social system theory and, uh, and the viable system model? Uh, they have certain things in common, like the notion of a system. It is a bit different though. Like if you try to apply Luhmann's social notion of system to the VSM, it would work for system one. It wouldn't work probably for the rest. But then it comes something else, which is then the recursion <coughs> In the case of Bible system model, it is achieved with the idea of a metasystem. There is also recursion in social system theory when it studies organizations. But it is achieved through the application of the difference between system and environment into the system itself. Then autopoiesis in VSM is used a bit metaphorically, in the social system theory is used a little. Information uh, is a bit differently understood. Uh, for the, the, the notion of information of, uh, in social system theory comes with the idea that information is something that informs. So it's the difference that makes difference in the basic terms. In that sense, uh, you cannot have the same as twice. And then we have uh, the law of requisite variety which is used a lot in both in the idea of uh, reduction of complexity and uncertainty. In the VSM, we have the usage of Ashby's ideas in the following way. There are attenuators and amplifiers with which we manage uh, the complexity. Once the regression uses them, and then the management uses them uh, to manage the complexity of the organization. That's how the balance is achieved. Now, having the idea of decision, decisions are also things which reduce complexity and create new complexity. They have certain, they have uncertainty before the agency is made, then it is made and this uncertainty is reduced. But then a new uncertainty is produced because maybe not, not will connect to that decision. So if you would like to use the idea of attenuators and, and amplifiers, you would have an, a, a filter, an attenuator before decision and always an amplifier after. Uh, what I find especially interesting is um, the idea of, of people in, in the VSM. Uh, everywhere in the books there's a lot about people, but then when you see the model, they are somehow missing. And that's been um, something raised, I think, by Hans or by many people that, that had some criticism for, for the VSM. And, and I think the socialist model provides a nice solution to that, which, when you check all the rest, is fitting logically quite well. This is how I draw the VSM with different sort of way uh, why you can see in that uh, reference. But basically, my answer is that uh, people are not in system one, two, three, four, and five, because systems are made not of people communications. Systems are, are people actually part of the environment. They produce all these systems. Of course, this is an ugly picture, so I would be I'll prefer if you can imagine something like that. With people being in the bubbles and, uh, uh, sorry, sitting in the bubbles and people being in their environment. Uh, the, the, the interest in, um, in decisions, uh, in fact, is, is very old. It's, it's four millennia or more old. Uh, in Babylonia, the, there were, you know, this. Uh, these tablets, and uh, some of them recorded omens, and omens were understood and actually referred to as God's decisions. What is even more interesting is 
done one of the first work uh, in philosophy, this dialogue of pessimism. A treating decisions already at that time as paradoxes, showing that the alternatives that they chose from are in fact equal. And then the interest has uh, it just is only increased. Even if you have watched the last episode of Black Mirror, it was not only about observing decisions, but um, the observer. Uh, was able to influence them by interacting with the movie. In organizations, the, the interesting part started from the work of uh, Herbert Simon, you know, uh, about nutritionality, satisfying, uh, and, then, and, and then further on with the garbage can model uh, until the work uh, of women. So, what I think, uh, I think this for me works best, is just to, to combine these two understandings of decisions. And, and why do we need to combine them? We need still the first of the observation to make better decisions. And we need the second to understand what decisions are and how they work. For making better decisions, what I found is uh, that it can be supported by better information management, by my better way of, of dealing with the data or with, with semantics, with the way a consistency is uh, achieved. And again, as I said, uh, that I would recommend doing it by decoupling data from applications because when the integration of data is in applications, then a lot of bad things happen. But also, we would need to understand decision processes uh, better. And, and one way of doing it is by, uh, by being serious about, about reasoning. Reasoning, from our side, there are quite nice ways to apply automatic reasoning in our organizations in our information systems, because currently most of the systems are like that. You can take from your database what you can tell the database, or what you can already tell the database. But it cannot get more, it cannot deduce, unless you apply uh, the, the different approach. And then also reasoning in terms of uh, different culture of uh, argumentation different way of, of showing uh, when, when things like the straw man, patting of ears or others, the chain of reasoning, the contentions, the objections, you can check out the work of um, King Van Gelder uh, on that. But also the decision processes you see as somewhere in the middle. And uh, something that would support them very well is the garbage can model which appeared in 1972, and after that, there was a lot of work done. Uh, and currently, there are some increases because it's especially useful when the situation is in certain. So how many of you are, know about the garbage can model? Okay, so just we talk a few things about it. So according to the garbage can model, all these sequence, you know, the problem, uh, then decision method finds it defines solution, uh, in most cases the analysis. What it happens in organizations, they are parallel streams. Stream of problems, stream of solutions, stream of vision matters. They're just, just going parallel. And they meet when there is a choice opportunity. A meeting or some, some other opportunity where the decisions can be made. And you can find out that in some cases there are um, uh, solutions looking for problems or decision makers that just want to uh, do what they do. And that depends on the current situation, on the, on the labels of each garbage can, uh, but, but there is no actual uh, logical sequence. But studying it would 
could improve about uh, the whole process. And then understanding decisions is also a matter of decision uh, paradoxes, which I'm trying to explain today, uh, including these eight applications. Now, um, I do not like futurists, but I'll make an exception and I'll try to, to predict something. Let's go to check with the room. Sorry? You couldn't check for the, the Rurani futurists in the room. But, no, it's all right. Go ahead, So, um, information management is improving. We have machine learning, we have field chain intelligence. So, there is a lot of technology to make better decisions and to predict what kind of decisions there will be. But I think this will paradoxically just bring the opposite. Decisions will become much more unpredictable because they would need too much the high unpredictability of the future, otherwise they are just all okay. And um, if, you, if you think about uh, the, the, the Ashby's law and, and how, just, just the idea of variety. And let's try to, to, to apply the idea of variety on the variety, sort of a second order exercise. Now, what I found out is that, in fact, we achieve filtering, attenuation, and amplification at once. How come? So the world is so diverse, there's so many things happening, and we reduce that into the notion of system, with which we understand it better. And then we have the complexity, and we reduce things like colors, numbers, uh, states, money, to one notion, the notion of variety. And that notion amplifies uh, our understanding. And now I'm coming to you doing the same with organizations. So things like organization power, tasks, constraints, planning time, so many things could be reduced to one decision and get better understanding. Let's think that agency means the need to act. Or we, I, I'm happy to go with it. If just being a definition, let me go with it. I don't care which one, which would be the best one. Agency is the ability to form a future that you want to bring about and work towards it, navigating a route, without having me be determined from behind, necessarily. I'm absolutely fine with that definition. I would go for the broader one because this implies time. So the broader one would be just the ability to independently do something. Okay. So not determined from outside. Not determined from internally. And I think the connection comes from that. So the system 
is able to observe itself and observe the difference between itself and the environment. This is the way it can create identity. The identity would mean that it is open to the environment because it's operationally closed. Otherwise, there will be nothing to be open to the environment because there will be no boundaries. And that, I think, is the basis of agency. So it, it goes through identity, autonomy, uh, and agency. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? I can hear you anyway. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Um, I very much uh, agree with your view about the, <coughs> the occasional criticism of the DSM doesn't include people. And I just want you to explore that a little more if we've got time, because I see communication quite often as conversations between people, not just documents, but conversations. Uh, a lot of work's been done on conversations in, in many disciplines, not just social and social sciences. And conversations, in my view, are fundamentally shaped by relationships between people and those pathways <coughs> rightly mapped out in your maps, <coughs> seem to me, will be shaped by relationships between people. I wonder how that would fit in to your way of thinking. In a minute, you have to go to the Thank you. That's difficult. I have to be a bit of a conversation. One of the popular misapplications of the SM is to say, well, um, that person is uh, part of system one, or this, this, these people are marketing, so that's sort of system four, and, and, and this kind of thing, uh, which wasn't anywhere in the books. If we understand system as something emergent, it can uh, have this downward causality and influence the interactions that may emerge. But then, not make, for example, if just we uh, today we agreed to it, so which would mean that we made system two possible. How come? Because we did not come any place but this place, so we reduced our um, freedom to come here and at this time. But that happening, which made this possible. Is no people. It's just our um, the result of our communications, which brought coordination to make this happen. And that could be exercised on any other uh, example of, of systems in the DSM. To see that uh, first, it's it's a matter of um, of communication, but then there will be another candidate to be used. That which will be the actions. So. Where is the place of actions? And my answer would be again in the environment. And that is a lot of thank you. Thank you. We're gonna have to take a break now. Um, thank you very much, Eva. Can I have everyone?